Professor Hoskin and Harcourt, and I'm given to understand practices in the securities and finance area. Peter has been a special lecturer in and the business law program at U of T has uh, done a bit of writing in his day and uh, occasionally between athletic activities and attending peculiar theatrical performances does a bit of work in the area he's going to talk about. Peter's subject for today is new instruments in public financing. Uh, after hearing Coleman, I wonder if those instruments are swords and shields and scalpels and nooses or just what they are, but I'll turn you over to Peter to find out. Thank you, uh, Jack. The, the subject for uh, my paper is new instruments in public financing. Uh, the subject is a topic uh, at this year's special lectures for a number of reasons, uh, but the most uh, relevant reason is probably I don't think ever before have uh, investment dealers, corporate finance departments, and their legal advisors been forced to innovate to the same degree in order to raise capital. The pressure to innovate is a product of our economic environment. Uh, because of the depressed state of our equ equity markets, uh, issuers look more to preferred share offerings with uh, equity kickers rather than straight equity offerings. The volatility of interest rates has resulted in debt instruments with shorter average terms and a variety of other provisions designed to protect both the uh, borrower and the lender against dramatic fluctuations in interest rates. The economic nationalism of certain of our governments uh, reflected in such programs as the National Energy Program has given new significance to constrained share financings. High incomes, high taxes, have generated some interesting tax shelter vehicles. Mm -hmm. To identify those financings which are uh, innovative, I've relied primarily upon discussions with investment dealers and to some degree upon personal experience. However, uh, I hasten to add that with respect to most of the deals that are discussed in my paper, I am looking from the outside in and therefore I am drawing inferences as to the uh, legal issues that face the issuer and its underwriters. The written paper itself is, is fairly technical and fairly lengthy. Uh, it uh, uh, combines a discussion of the corporate securities and tax aspects of the instruments discussed. The tax discussion, I hasten to add, has been carefully reviewed by one of my tax colleagues. Um, it also includes a discussion of some of the market considerations involved in the design of the terms of the securities. Uh, this afternoon, I think what I should try and do is just summarize what's in the paper and leave the more technical aspects to the written paper. The corporate statutes on which the paper focuses are the CBCA and the amendments uh, proposed to the CBCA by the Energy Security Bill, which is now speeding its way through the House of Commons. Um, and Bill 6, the proposed new Ontario Business Corporations Act, which has uh, had second reading in the Ontario Legislature and is now before the Standing Committee for the Administration of Justice. The paper is divided into three parts. The first part describes some of the bells and whistles which are attached to conventional securities. The second part analyzes what has been done already in the way of constrained share financing under the National Energy Program and uh, considers what may be possible under the uh, proposed amendments to the OBCA and the CBCA. And the third and final part identifies a couple of new financing techniques. A final preliminary point Although the financings uh, which form the basis of this paper are basically public financings, I've found that some of the, or many of the innovations that have been uh, involved in the instruments discussed are probably adaptable to the uh, private company situation. Consider first how some of our conventional instruments have been redesigned. Interestingly enough, uh, a lot of the uh, redesigning of our conventional 
instruments has been accomplished by our most conservative of financial institutions, the uh, chartered banks. The banks have been able to replace a conservative approach to corporate finance with a more innovative approach as a result of the enactment of the 1980 Bank Act. Under the predecessor act, uh, the 1967 Act, banks were essentially limited to raising equity capital uh, by rights offerings uh, of their one class of shares to their existing shareholders. The 1980 Bank Act adopts the more, uh, or adopts the flexible provisions of the CBCA. Looking first at the conversion privilege, the right to uh, convert a security into another security. This uh, aspect of preferred shares has been uh, stretched and pulled in some very imaginative ways. As you're aware, the uh, conversion privilege could be attached to either debt or equity securities. Um, one issuer that uh, I'm familiar with offered both convertible preferreds and convertible debt at the same time. Uh, this was the approach used by the Royal Bank uh, when it offered uh, on the same date last November $200 million of convertible preferred shares and $150 million of convertible debentures. Both prospectuses were cleared at the same time and the underwriters were able to offer investors a choice between debentures which would generally appeal to uh, tax-exempt investors such as pension funds uh, because of their higher yield and the preferred shares, which would uh, be of greater interest to tax-paying investors. Offering debt and equity at the same time may become a more common financing technique, a public financing technique, uh, with the volatility of our securities markets and the windows for particular types of, of securities opening and closing overnight. Issuers will want to be poised to be able to jump through those windows with either uh, debt or preferred shares on short notice. The conversion feature on a security facilitates the sale of securities in difficult markets and also enables the issuer to save an estimated 3 to 4 percent on the dividend rate which uh, would be required on a comparable security without the conversion feature. A, a point to note about the legal framework in which convertible preferred shares are authorized, both the CBCA and Bill 6, the new OBCA provide that if the authorized number of preferred shares is limited, then both acts will require the uh, corporation to reserve and to continue to reserve sufficient authorized shares to meet the exercise of the conversion privilege. Reserving shares is done by way of a director's resolution and normally a note would be made against the uh, share capital of the corporation in its uh, balance sheet uh, disclosing the reservation. We normally think of the conversion privilege as being exercisable only by the investor. However, two of the banks, Bank of Montreal and the Royal, issued convertible preferreds during 1981, providing for the conversion privilege to be exercised not only by the holder, but also by the bank, the issuer. Now, the market acknowledges that there are legitimate circumstances where the issuer should be able to force the holder out of his preferred share and thereby relieve the issuer of the obligation of paying dividends. And normally this would be done by providing in the terms of the preferred share that if the underlying common shares are trading at a specified premium over market, the preferred shares may be called for redemption by the issuer and the wise investor will convert his shares and realize his premium. In the case of the two bank issues, the banks themselves can cause the conversion of the preferred shares if the common shares, again, are trading at a specified premium over the conversion price. This technique of forcing the conversion makes a lot of sense for banks uh, who would require the consent of the Inspector General of Banks if they were going to redeem the shares or at least uh, propose to redeem the shares in order to trigger the redemption. But I think the technique will also uh, make sense for other issuers because uh, it would uh, remove the uncertainty attached with using the market call through the redemption, uh, the uncertainty of knowing how many shares will be converted, how many shares will have to be redeemed, and providing for uh, or trying to guess at how many shares will be redeemed. 
variations in the, uh, this force conversion technique are, are possible. Uh, for example, the conversion ratio could be adjusted so that uh, the shareholder gets more shares if the bank exercises the conversion privilege than if the holder exercises the conversion privilege. Warrants are very much like conversion privileges. Uh, as you're probably aware, warrants are not normally issued alone. They're usually attached to some other security. But warrants do differ in one significant respect from uh, conversion privileges. The right to acquire the share uh, is separately uh, or is capable of being traded separately. Now, how has the warrant been used to facilitate recent financings? The Bank of Montreal issued uh, preferred shares in November of last year, the holders of which are entitled to two warrants. The warrants are strippable from the preferred shares at two points in time. The unique feature of these warrants is that the holder has the option of exercising the warrant by tendering the preferred shares rather than paying cash. Uh, these preferred shares and the warrants designed in this way come very close to be uh, in combination to be a convertible preferred share, but again, the warrant has separate value and, and can be uh, traded separately from the conversion privilege that would be attached to a convertible preferred share. <coughs> Another feature of... <coughs> Another feature of this type of provision is that the downside of the investment in the preferred shares is limited in that the full price paid for the preferred share can be recovered through the exercise of the warrant. The investor will get full credit for his purchase price when he purchases the underlying common share. You get full credit for the preferred share. The tax consequences of tendering preferred shares to purchase the common shares are generally the same as the tax consequences of converting a preferred share into a common share. The investor has a rollover. It's possible a, a variation on that warrant exercise feature is possible. The warrants uh, could be exercisable by applying shares issued by an issuer other than the issuer of the warrant. And this is a, a feature in the uh, Dome Peat common share purchase warrants that uh, proposed to be issued in connection with the arrangement of the Hudson's Bay oil and gas. The Dome Peat warrants will be exercisable by tendering shares of Dome Resources, which is a company related to Dome Peat. Another variation on the terms uh, of warrants that was introduced this year was introduced by the CIBC. It issued uh, warrants carrying the right, uh, sorry, it issued preferred shares carrying the right to receive warrants. <coughs> However, the uh, preferred shares were to purchase, or, sorry, the warrants were to purchase additional preferred shares rather than common shares. And this would mean that if all the warrants were exercised at some later point in time, the issuer would have, <coughs> in effect, doubled the size of its uh, original issue. Um, without the additional cost of a second prospectus offering. There is an aspect of the closed system under the Securities Act that is applicable to the exercise of conversion privileges and the exercises, exercise of rights under warrants that uh, should be carefully considered by new issuers of preferred shares and warrants. The trade involved in the uh, exercise of the conversion privilege or in the uh, exercise of the warrant is clearly exempt from the registration and prospectus requirements of the Act. However, the underlying shares are issued into the closed system, which prescribes that the first trade in the underlying security by the investor who has exercised the conversion privilege or exercised the warrant is free of the prospectus requirements if the issuer has been a reporting issuer for at least 12 months. 
accordingly if a company decides to go public and it decides that the only way it can go public in these depressed markets is to uh, attach warrants to its uh, preferred shares or to issue convertible preferred shares um, it may have a problem because the company will first become a reporting issuer when it files the prospectus and if the warrant or the conversion privilege is exercisable uh, within 12 months after the date of issue, the investor who exercises that right will have trouble disposing of his, his shares during that first 12 months, the underlying shares, that is. The absurdity of this situation is, is apparent, and uh, it's apparent to the Securities Commission, uh, which has recommended an amendment to the Securities Act to the minister, which would allow the uh, person who exercises the conversion privilege to trade the underlying uh, shares within the 12-month period uh, if certain conditions are satisfied, and these are other types of conditions which one might normally expect and are not onerous. One of the most innovative warrants uh, in the past year is a commodity-based warrant uh, issued by Echo Bay Mines Limited in connection with an issue of preferred shares. The offering was made in units. <coughs> it consisted of a preferred share and four gold purchase warrants. The warrants were not to purchase additional shares of the issuer. The warrant was to purchase a product of the issuer once it went into production. The exercise price of the warrants was set at the price uh, as the price of gold at the end of the month preceding the date of the issue of the units, and that at that point in time was $595 US dollars per ounce which with the decline in gold prices in the past year has unfortunately made these uh, commodity-based warrants not very attractive investments. But you can imagine the innovating that must have been involved in drafting the warrant indenture. Uh, it would have to contain a number of provisions that would not be found in a normal warrant indenture. Back before the uh, November 1978 budget, when uh, preferred shares were being designed to look like debt securities, variable rate dividends were a common characteristic of preferred shares. Typically, the dividend rate was designed to float with the prime lending rate of a designated chartered bank. The floating dividend uh, rate continues to be a characteristic of a number of preferred share offerings again because of the volatility of interest rates and because of the demand for investors against protection or for protection against rising interest rates. One example of this is again uh, one of the banks, the TD Bank issued uh, variable rate preferred shares last year with a dividend rate equal to one and three quarters percent plus one half of its uh, prime lending rate. Um, the shares specify a minimum rate to protect investors against a dramatic decline in interest rates, a so-called caller. However, uh, this was the type of concession which was probably not too difficult for the underwriter to wrench from the issuer, particularly in view of current uh, interest rate trends. A final uh, innovation to the preferred shares, and this is truly an innovation of the 70s, and that's the development of the retraction privilege. The retraction privilege, like the variable dividend rate, uh, resulted from efforts to simulate the terms of a debt instrument in the terms of preferred shares. The retraction privilege, in effect, allows the investor to put the securities back to the issuer at specified points in time. The significant difference between a debt security and a retractable preferred is that there are limitations upon a corporate issuer's ability to redeem shares in response to the exercise of a retraction privilege. For example, a CBCA corporation cannot redeem its shares if by doing so it would un be unable to pay its liabilities as they become due. Uh, its failure to redeem would not constitute a default, but you compare that with a failure of an issuer of a debenture to make a principal payment, which would normally constitute a default. It's therefore standard prospectus disclosure that if the redemption would be contrary to uh, applicable law, prospectus disclosure for retractable preferred shares, that if the redemption would be contrary to applicable law, 
the issuer is only required to redeem on a pro rata basis the maximum number of shares that it would be permitted to uh, redeem under applicable law. Now, issuers have developed features uh, in retractable preferreds to in induce the holders not to exercise their retraction privileges. Uh, for example, the shares may provide that at any retraction date, the directors may increase the dividend rate on the retractable preferred shares, or the, uh, the issuer may elect to offer to holders of the retractable preferreds the right to exchange those shares into a new uh, series or class of shares which would presumably have uh, attributes that would be more sensitive to the market conditions which exist at the time the retraction privilege is exercisable. Obviously, if the issuer is successful in inducing the holders not to exercise their retraction rate, uh, rights, the issuer will have saved the expense of uh, or the cost of raising whatever funds are necessary to fund the retraction privilege. A tax note, um, and only note, whenever one is considering a preferred share financing, one of the first concerns must be to ascertain whether or not the preferred shares will be term preferred shares for purposes of the Income Tax Act. Um, if a share is a term preferred share, the normal deduction of intercorporate dividends is not permitted. In the November budget, uh, it was proposed to expand the concept of term preferred shares to reduce after-tax financing. It was proposed that the deduction for intercorporate dividends not be permitted where within five years from the date on which the shares were issued, the holders of the shares could require the redemption, cancellation, or reduction of the paid-up capital of the share. Obviously, this is a, a key provision to any lawyer who is designing the terms of a preferred shares, the five years being the magic number. The foregoing are some examples of features developed for conventional financing instruments to raise capital in difficult market conditions. I'd like to turn now to a discussion of constrained share financings an area of corporate finance which puts additional pressure on lawyers to innovate. Indeed, I've taken the opportunity provided by writing this paper to get carried away a bit by constrained share financings because I'm, I'm so amazed at the implications for our securities markets in, in, uh, of constrained share financings. Constrained share financings are financings designed to enable the issuer of constrained shares to limit the percentage of its shares that may be owned by a constrained class of holders. And the best example is provided by the National Energy Program. One of the stated purposes of the NEP is to increase the Canadian ownership of the petroleum and natural gas industry. To achieve this, the government proposes, instead of offering tax incentives, uh, which must be available to everybody, to offer incentive payments for exploration and development expenditures. These uh, payments, so-called PIP payments, uh, the level of those payments will be related to the level of Canadian ownership of the applicant. Now, until last week when the Energy Security Bill was introduced, the industry relied on a release of the Petroleum Monitoring Agency last spring as the basis for determining the Canadian ownership rate, the core, of uh, various companies. The uh, new energy security legislation, I think it's Bill 94, um, includes rules uh, relating to PIP and PIP payments and core. For our purposes, it is sufficient to note that the NEP motivated constraints on shares are responsive to a twofold test. Number one, the applicant must be Canadian controlled, and for uh, purposes of the core rules, Canadian control is determined by relying on provisions in the Foreign Investment Review Act. The applicant must not be a non eligible person under that act. And secondly, the core of the applicant, the Canadian ownership rate, must be at a specified minimum level before it can uh, qualify for incentive payments. And the amount of the payments it, it fluctuates with the level of the core of the applicant. 
The core of the applicant is ascertained by measuring generally the beneficial ownership of participating securities issued by the applicant. There's also a concept of informal equity which uh, deals with other arrangements such as uh, royalty agreements, uh, arrangements that give uh, persons other participations than through securities in the revenues of the applicant. The easiest example for measuring a core is the core of an individual. Uh, it's either 100 percent or 0 percent. Uh, a Canadian citizen resident in Canada has a core of 100 percent. The core of a corporate applicant is more difficult to measure. Um, you really have to get into a measurement of the cores of the various shareholders and then the shareholders above that. And there's the complicated formulas that you may be familiar with for measuring the core of a corporate applicant. It's apparent that the core of a corporation will always be changing depending upon the ownership of its shares, the various royalty arrangements that it has in place. Um, this, this stuff is really technical, but uh, when it has to be seriously considered by every uh, company that is spending money out in the oil patch. Uh, the implications, I think, for all of us are, are profound. There are two NEP-motivated, publicly offered constrained share financings that I'm aware of. One was the offering of common shares and warrants by Dome Canada in March of last year and the other was the offering of convertible preferred shares by Ranchman's Resources. Both of these companies were Alberta Companies Act companies. The offerings, neither of the offerings could have been done under the CBCA or the OBCA as they stand uh, because neither statute affords the issuer the type of power that it needs in order to administer a, a program for either increasing its core or maintaining its core at a specified level. Some of the powers that are necessary uh, number one, the company will want to restrict the issue, transfer, and ownership of its shares based on the NEP test of Canadian ownership and not as provided in those statutes based simply on Canadian residency. You can be a Canadian resident, but what's important for the NEP is your core. Secondly, the issuer must have the power to require its shareholders to provide it with the information necessary so that it can measure its core. And thirdly, if the issuer has holders that uh, hold constrained shares but go offside, they become ineligible. They may have purchased when they had a high core, but for various circumstances, uh, their cores have gone down. The corporation may need the power to redeem that shareholder out or to sell the shares that he owns on his behalf. The CBCA does provide or contemplate some constrained share financings, but uh, it's limited in that they're allowed, the constraints are allowed only to resident Canadians. The OBCA is very vague. It allows restrictions on the transfer of shares of public offering corporations only if the restrictions are necessary for the purpose of achieving or preserving the corporation's status as a Canadian corporation, and that term is not defined. There are no sanctions to administer or enforce the constraints. Um, and uh, another factor which I guess we're all becoming sensitive to uh, with the CBCA is the existing of dis existence of dissenting shareholders' rights. Um, these must be taken into account whenever a corporation is contemplating changing its charter so that it can, uh, in effect, control its core. The limitations upon a corporation's ability to constrain its shares under both the CBCA and the OBCA were factors in the decision uh, of both Dome Canada and I understand Ranchman's Resources to incorporate under the Alberta Companies Act. Under the Alberta Companies Act, at least at the relevant time, uh, it was a registration act uh, providing for memorandum of association companies and therefore and, and those companies uh, would enjoy much greater flexibility in the terms that could be put in their articles. The articles simply constitute a contract amongst the company and its various members, and they're enforceable. The contract is enforceable. In the Dome Canada case, uh, it was apparent from the prospectus and the memorandum of association 
that the company uh, had two objectives. First, it wanted to qualify for maximum PIP grants. However, one of the major shareholders of Dome Canada was to be Dome Peat, and uh, it obviously wanted a major share because it was allowing Dome Canada to farm in on all of its uh, valuable exploratory lands. Dome Peat had a core uh, less than, I don't know whether it was disclosed in the prospectus, but it was substantially less than 100%, and therefore its ownership of shares of Dome Canada would reduce Dome Canada's core. So the type of constraint that the draftsman came up with was to limit the ownership of Dome Canada shares to people that had 100% core to offset the impact or the contribution to the Dome Canada's core that the major shareholder, Dome Pete, would have. There was no ambiguity as to what core uh, shareholders had to have to own shares of Dome Canada. Uh, the only ambiguity is, was in how shareholders could ascertain what their uh, respective cores were. And the draftsman of the Memorandum of Association for these purposes incorporated by reference the PMA release that I referred to and also contemplated that once there was core legislation introduced, it would be incorporated by reference. The second objective in the share constraints was to impose a limitation on the extent of the shareholdings of any one shareholder to 5%. This provision was designed to ensure that control of the company always remained vested in a person that was not a non-eligible person under the Foreign Investment Review Act and it would also facilitate uh, market liquidity in the event that there was a forced sale of a shareholder. The Energy Security Bill includes proposed amendments to the, OBC, to the CBCA to accommodate the NEP-motivated constrained share financings. The provisions in the Energy Security Bill have been developed by the Federal Department of Consumer and Corporate Affairs, and they were made available, we understand, to the Ontario Department of Consumer and Commercial Relations, and if you look at Bill 6, as it's been amended before the uh, Standing Committee on Administration of Justice, Bill 6 now includes uh, sh uh, provisions that parallel the uh, proposed uh, revisions to the CBCA. Uh, in summary, the types of amendments that are being made will first of all allow the imposition of constraints to uh, which will constrain the issue, transfer, or ownership of shares of any class in order to assist the corporation or any of its affiliates or associates to qualify for uh, grants. It's not stated in terms of the National Energy Program, but the language is clearly responsive to the National Energy Program. There are important amendments to dissenting shareholders' rights. Uh, on the one hand, dissenting rights are conferred in certain events. On the other hand, uh, dissenting rights are taken away. Uh, they're conferred if a corporation, say a one-class share corporation, common shares, it imposes constraints on, the, uh, on that one class of shares, then the shareholders of that class will have a right to dissent. Uh, I'm not, I can't imagine many corporations wanting to constrain an existing class of shares, it would just be too expensive unless it was a private corporation with, uh, say, 100 percent core that was contemplating going public. Uh, the other uh, change in the existence of dissenting shareholders' rights is that uh, if a new class of shares is created which is equal to an existing class of shares, except that it ha includes a constraint, then the creation of that new class of shares is deemed not to be the creation of a class of shares that is equal to or superior to the existing class. So that removes the need for a separate class vote. And similarly, the addition of a conversion feature to an existing class of shares to convert into a constrained class of shares does not uh, provide a right of dissent. In the written paper, I've, I've taken uh, some examples of companies with various share structures and, and contemplated when dissenting rights would be available and when they wouldn't be. Another technique proposed by the CBCA, which will facilitate constrained share 
financings or cons at least facilitate the uh, increase of a corporation's core is that a corporation may acquire and hold another class of shares that are not constrained. A constrained share company may go into the market, make an issuer bid, buy back shares that are not constrained. Or it may buy shares that are not constrained but are convertible into constrained shares, buy them back, and then convert them itself and reissue them. Now, if it holds the shares for less than two years or it gets rid of them within a period of less than two years, it's not obligated to uh, reduce its stated capital uh, in the amount of the shares purchased back. And that, that can be important for various purposes. Um, the, I heard the word draconian in the last uh, lecture. Uh, perhaps the most draconian provision in both the CBCA and the proposed uh, OBCA is the ability of CBCA companies uh, to sell out the shares of ineligible holders. Um, if a shareholder goes offside, the corporation can sell the shares owned by that holder as if the corporation itself was a holder. Um, as a result of the sale, the former holder is divested of his share interest and his, his sole interest is in uh, receiving the proceeds of the sale plus interest accruing on the net proceeds. Now the directors are obligated to select the shares for sale quote, in good faith and in a manner that is not unfairly prejudicial to and does not unfairly disregard the interests of the holders of the shares in the constrained class or series taken as a whole, unquote. The, this power represents a departure from the fundamental corporate premise of impartial treatment of shareholders of the same class, and I'm sure it'll give rise to a lot of interesting questions and perhaps new uses of the oppression remedy. Um, again, in the written paper, I've given a checklist of various considerations to be taken into account in formulating share constraints. Um, one point I should mention is that there is a provision in both the proposed OBCA and CBCA that is addressed specifically to a constraint that would limit the number of shares a holder can hold. Um, the possibility of constraining shares to limit the extent of a shareholder's holdings uh, might be tempting to a corporation which is a potential target for a takeover bid if it could show that uh, without the limitation, uh, its ability to qualify for PIP payments or its ability, the ability of any of its affiliates or associates to qualify for the payments might be adversely affected. Uh, don't forget policy, OSC policy 358 uh, on uncommon equity shares or restricted shares. That policy could be relevant uh, in, uh, to a constrained share company, particularly where the constraints relate to the extent of each shareholder's holdings. As I say, uh, I'm, uh, when I start thinking about this area of the corporate law, I start thinking about what impact it will have or constrained share financings will have on our securities markets. Constrained share financings will obviously eliminate a large segment of potential purchasers of shares for resource companies. It will further contribute to the thinness of our equity markets in uh, shares of resource companies. It will drive the prices down um, before any constraints are introduced on a company's sh uh, share capital. Uh, the corporations will have to look very hard at these uh, implications. <coughs> Finally, let me touch on two financing techniques, and this is out of the constrained share area, and these two techniques I would characterize as innovative. The first is the so-called flow-through financing. These uh, financings are intended to provide investors with a shelter from income tax, and, and, and those of you who are lucky to, enough to be looking for tax shelter and, and lucky enough to be looking for tax shelter right at this time of the year may be familiar with the recent flow-through financing offered by Numac Oil and Gas. 
uh, it's a fairly typical or is fairly typical of the flow through financings that uh, I have observed. The financing is structured so that the enter uh, investor enters into an agreement with the issuer, and this would probably be in the subscription agreement. And you know, under the agreement, the investor agrees to incur certain resource expenses which entitle him to uh, deductions against his taxable income under the Income Tax Act. The resource expenses are incurred under the agreement uh, for the benefit of the corporation, and therefore the corporation will get the direct benefit of the expenses. The consideration for this benefit are the shares that the corporation will issue to the investor, and then the tax deductions flow through the corporation to the investor. We may see more of these financings because in uh, the November budget, uh, if you read it, the government is apparently trying to encourage this type of financing. Under the November budget, it proposes to treat shares received by the investor in these circumstances as capital property with a nil cost base. And under the Act as it now stands, the shares would be treated as inventory and any proceeds of a flow-through share re realized before the budget is uh, law would be taxed as income. The other in innovative financing technique, which I'd like to describe briefly, is the so-called debt equity swap. The technique is best described by example. The Bank of Montreal has a couple of series of debentures outstanding. They were issued some time ago by uh, public offering. Uh, they have coupons of, I think one was 9% and the other was 9.25%. What the bank did was uh, it convened meetings of the holders of the debentures under, uh, as provided in the trust indenture, and at the meeting it proposed extraordinary resolutions to the debenture holders, uh, and under the uh, resolution a right to convert the debentures into common shares for a period of 30 days following the meeting was included or added to the terms of the debentures. And the conversion right was structured so that it would be attractive to the debenture holders. Um, that wasn't too difficult because uh, uh, debentures with these coupons in today's markets were trading, I think uh, they were issued at, say, $1,000. They're trading around $800. So the conversion rate is set so that the debenture holder realizes a premium over the market value of his debenture when he swaps the debenture for common shares. The common shares themselves can be priced at a bit of a premium as well, so that uh, the, the issuer wins both ways. <clears throat> the investor is happy because he gets the premium, and the issuer is happy because he realizes an unrealized asset on his balance sheet. He's got the face value of debt at $1,000, and yet he pays something less than $1,000 to realize the asset. The swap done in this way is very sweet. There's a prospectus exemption for the issue of the uh, equity shares. Uh, no prospectus costs involved. The debenture holder generally has a tax rollover, and he, it's, or it's a tax-free event for him. The U.S. approach to the debt equity swap is a little different. It's basically an underwriting of equity shares for which the underwriter, instead of paying cash at the closing, he tenders debt that he has uh, lined up in the market. And uh, as I understand it from the Forbes article that I read, uh, the swap done in this manner is a tax-free reorganization, and therefore it's a tax-free uh, transaction to both the issuer and the investor. I don't think that's the case in Canada, so we haven't seen any debt equity swaps done in that manner. If we do, and there's convertible debt involved, then we'll be getting into the issuer bid provisions of the Securities Act and the CBCA if it's a CBCA issuer. Let me say in conclusion that uh, the, an issuer proposing to issue an instrument that is completely new and different is, is one circumstance which I think provides, truly provides a lot of fun in the practice of law. The, the lawyer has an opportunity from a different perspective 
to test all of the conventional factors that he takes into account uh, in considering a financing. Uh, the conventional factors include the statutory authority for the issuer and the instrument, the tax implications. If, there is, uh, if the security has a kicker attached to it, a kicker exercisable at some time in the future, then the tax implication in tax and securities implications of the exercise of that right will have to be analyzed. The eligibility of the new instrument for investment, um, whether the security can be listed, and so on. Uh, perhaps the greatest uh, or greatest potential source for fun in this area is uh, that the lawyer may have an opportunity to influence policy. Uh, securities commissions have been issuing policies at great rate. Uh, you, your instrument may trigger a policy and yet you may be in a position to influence the terms of the policy or even government legislation. The instruments, innovative instruments, provide us with an opportunity to get outside of our specialties and search for and look at unfamiliar legislation. In short, I guess what we all need in regular doses is lots of clients with capital needs and markets which demand innovative financing instruments and techniques. Thank you.